Greetings, everybody. Glad you could be with us tonight. We're excited about our guest, uh, Dr. Mike Hutchins, H Hutchings, sorry, who uh, we've known for many years but haven't seen in a while, so we're catching up here before we started. And uh, just going to talk about trauma and healing and a little bit of his background and just so glad you could be with us, Mike. Thank you so much for making the time. Peter and Patricia, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's great to see you again. The last time we actually saw each other was at your church for the uh, ISDM conference, yes. which was just amazing. And so I love who you are. I love what you do, What the, the presence of God that is so powerful at King of Kings there. So thank it's just an honor to be with you guys. Today. Yeah, we got to have you to our new place now. We're on 45 acres of land. So uh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's really been uh, a cool transition. Although not easy, you know, because of COVID, oh, nothing's yeah. easy. Um, so I thought maybe just a quick background, if you don't mind. I, I was reading about you being a Baptist pastor in St. Louis in 1983. You knew Randy yeah. Clark. You heard about what was going on in Toronto. Um, I remember him telling oh. the story that somebody called and said, Randy, you're not going to believe it. There's a pastor in Toronto named Randy Clark, and he's from St. Louis. And they didn't think it was him, right, because they never imagined oh. he could be that guy. The funny part about this is, is that, you know, this, we went back to 83, Randy and I, we were in sister churches about eight miles apart in Southern Illinois. And uh, when Randy invited a team from the vineyard that was led by Blaine Cook into his church, I would, I helped him kind of put those meetings together, was part, part of those meetings. And of course we were impacted so powerfully by the Holy Spirit, by his presence and power, by the healings that, uh, you know, we tried to implement it in our Baptist churches, but Baptists don't really, you know, have, they have a lot of uh, difficulty with that stuff. And so we both ended up, he moved to St. Louis to plant the vineyard there. I moved up to Peoria, Illinois, where I'm from originally, and helped uh, plant two churches there. And so we went on this amazing church planting uh, journey from basically 86 until the 90s. And uh, of course, in 94, Randy went to Toronto. And I was, I mean, I didn't hear about what's happening in Toronto until uh, like a year later, I didn't even know what was happening. And I was, I was, I really celebrated because Randy and I had been through from the eighties into the early nineties. It was a real wilderness, but, uh, right. God was faithful and so excited. I celebrated what God was doing with my friend and I still do. As a matter of fact, I work for him now. So yeah. That's so cool. Help me part of his dream, which is amazing. And you, you uh, had to have a lot of courage to walk away from the security of that career, quote unquote. And, yeah. and step out onto the side that looked like, you know, maybe lacking a little theology, lacking a little doctrine on the Pentecostal side, uh, some excesses that have happened over the years. But when you know that people, sorry, go ahead. We, uh, we were planting right in the middle of that late 80s phenomenon that called the scandals of the televangelists. Right. And all of those that were happening at the very same time. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of them were all about healing. So here we were. We, as we were trying to church plant and evangelize, we were getting thrown in the same uh, same basket with them. And so right. it was really, it was, it was a tough time, mm -hmm. but the Lord was faithful to us. We, yeah. you, know, you, keep re you know, you guys know this, when you keep reaching out to broken people and give them the good news, you know, they become a, a key part of what you're doing. It's so, true. Their it's testimony true. then becomes the witness to everybody that they know. And you also had a, prof you have a professional license as a counselor. So you had a a practice, and was it just Christian counseling, or were you just meeting out no, with anybody? As a matter of fact, um, I went into counseling because I needed an income. I was church planting, mm -hmm. and my church didn't provide a salary for me. So I first started off working uh, with adolescents and uh, runaways in a um, in a in a uh, psych a practice with a psychologist, a child psychologist, where I did adolescent family therapy. And then I ended up becoming a clinical coordinator for runaways and homeless youth. And I supervised 13 counselors. And uh, I did that for 10 years while I was planning the church, uh, not really understanding what God was doing in terms of the whole setup. But uh, yeah, I, I was licensed and uh, it really became a big part of, of what I was doing during that time of church planning. Seems like there's a lot of overlap in principles between Christian counseling but the, what, where they don't overlap could really be dangerous. If we allow that building up of the self to creep into Christian counseling, that well, could be toxic. 
it, it can be. And I was a Christian operating in what would be considered a social work kind of non-Christian environment. Mm -hmm. But uh, you always bring the principles of the kingdom in. Right. And they always work no matter what. You, as long as you take the Christian needs out of it, you just bring in the right. principles, they work every time, don't they? Yeah. And you feel the desperation of the people that don't know the Lord because they don't have any anywhere to land their anchor. They, they got nothing to hold on to. So it's all this sure. sinking sand of the world. Yeah. Do you want to say yeah. something, Trish? No, no, I just was agreeing with, uh, with, 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 with what you were saying. I mean, had it not been for the Lord, you know, in my life, I, I don't know that I'd even be alive right now. And that the principles of the gospel is what set me free. And, and that's the beauty of what we're even going to discuss tonight, that there's hope. You know, and regardless of how difficult or how bad your situation may appear to be, or actually is, there's hope because God always provides a way of escape and healing. Right. So could you just explain um, a little bit about GSSM and what you do there? So uh, Randy had a, from the time that I met Randy in the 80s, he always had a dream of a ministry school. And at that time, it was not necessarily a spirit-filled ministry school, but he always had a heart to equip and train folks. So uh, back in 2005, uh, Randy uh, began a global school of supernatural ministry under the auspices of Global Awakening. Uh, Bethel Church in Reading had started a school of supernatural ministry. So Randy went to Bill Johnson and said, hey, do you care if we do one out here in the East Coast? And of course, Bill said, go for it. So uh, first started by Tom Rutolo and then uh, Max Myers was the uh, director for a number of years and I came on board in 2012 and it is a, a full-time ministry school four days a week where we uh, raise up we equip we train we uh, deploy and impart uh, supernatural disciples of Jesus Christ Amen. who are seeking to use their lives to make an impact in whatever sphere of influence they have so it started out as a missionary school it kind of broadened into pastors and ministers. But now we have people that come to the school that are from all seven mountains. So we have educators, we have government folks, we have folks who work in, in as entrepreneurs in the financial industry, uh, as well as those who are maybe looking for another career uh, in or are calling into the ministry, whether it be a pastor, evangelist, itinerant, and so um it's an it's an amazing ride. So we bring in lots of teachers, like obviously Randy Clark. We bring in uh, Tricia Frost. We bring in Mark Verkler, Life Hetland, um, Chris Gore. Bring in all these amazing teachers that come and just equip and train and release uh, amazing men and women of God. And the great thing about GSSM is it's people of all ages. Mm -hmm. When they when people talk to me about my students, they say your kids, and I said, well, if you call kids, people who are in their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s, their 60s, <laughs> even some of their 70s. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. But it's a, it's such a privilege to be part of the disciple making movement. At yeah, we were out there back then when Clark Street was just being built and Charity Cook was just one of the assistants. Now she's got her own ministry. It's amazing. That's part right. of that impartation, you know, to see how people can grow in the Lord so well. Um, and we love Randy. We, we, you know, we were part of that in, in the early days and uh, just love the humility between him and his wife. Like they never, ever got uh, inflated in their ego. And it really comes across, you know, like little old me is what, one of the things he likes to say. And we just posted, with your permission, one of the videos of this mm -hmm. guy, uh, Adrian, I guess, that uh, has severe trauma from, uh, he was a war veteran. And uh, he said, I lost myself a few wars ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never forgot that line, and I heard that. And he was coming to get physical healing, but then maybe you could unpack that story a little bit. I'll be glad to. So uh, Adrian was literally the, the second uh, veteran that I had prayed for with post-traumatic stress disorder. After uh, having an encounter with the Holy Spirit, when Randy asked me to pray for a guy in Urbana, Illinois, uh, we were there for healing. And uh, that guy got set free after I asked the Holy Spirit, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you wanna do here? <laughs> well, at, at Bethel, which is where the video was, um, this guy came forward in a walker. He had a severe chronic nerve pain and he had been in a hospital bed and he had gotten a medical discharge from the Air Force. He was on his way to becoming a chief in the Air Force. 
And then after just seeing some horrific things in Haiti and, and, and on other parts of uh, deployment, um, he just came down with a severe case of chronic nerve pain, but also post-traumatic stress. So he, uh, he came up to the stage that night and asked Randy for a book on identity. And Randy really felt that he needed prayer. Uh, and so he asked me, I was actually in the foyer and he was calling out my name, my cutching, somebody find my cutching. So I <laughs> came up and uh, Randy was holding this guy's hand. He was on the, on the floor, kneeling on the floor with this guy. And, and uh, so I went up and I began to pray for him. And uh, you know, I first went after the post-traumatic stress disorder that he was suffering. Um, and as we prayed for that, we, we prayed for lots of things, the way trauma affects so many parts of the mind, of, this, of the body. Um, but as, as I began to pray, we spoke healing. And by the time we got done, not only was he had, have a sense of freedom, but he also had a tremendous sense of all of his chronic nerve pain was gone. Sure. And, uh, as you, and then as you know, he came back a couple of days later and uh, was there just to give more testimony and he got more healing. Right. And I remember Tom Jones, who's the executive a vice president of, sure. of Global Awakening, uh, the next day after his healing was actually on the bridge there outside of uh, out of uh, where the Civic Auditorium is. And he met Adrian and his kids. And he says, I've been able to hold on to my kids and play with them. And I haven't been able to do that for over five years. Yeah. Which is just an amazing thing. And the so, way yeah. he described the pain, he said it was like being cut with razor blades, having acid poured on your skin, and your bones being broken 24-7. And wow. it was gone. He said it was a five-minute prayer. But I love what he said when he told the story. He said, you know, Mike's a big guy, and he, and he grabbed my hands, and I was thinking I could take him. I think I could take this guy. And, and then, you know, he tried to look away because of the shame, I guess, and you made him continue to look. And he's like, stop telling me what to do because <laughs> he's, a, he's a veteran. He's a big guy, right? Yeah. And, and because you loved him, and you, you just said, I'm not going to let you lower your head. I want you to look in my eyes when I pray for you. That's such a key, loving thing to do for people, you know, because so many people pray with their eyes closed. They don't realize the power of that impartation of a father's blessing. And, yeah. you know, it's just a beautiful thing. It's so encouraging to, to let people see when that dramatic thing can happen, that it's a great reason to keep getting up and doing it every day because you, you, you know that God wants to keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and honestly, Peter and Patricia, I have to tell you, uh, I it was never on my radar to pray for people with trauma, even though I had had a counseling background. You know, I was I was there doing the education for Randy. I still am and raising up disciples and ministering to folks. Uh, but the idea of being known as a guy who brings healing to trauma was something not only wasn't on my radar, but I really didn't want it because as you know, if you, if you counsel people with trauma, you just have to hear these horrible stories all the time. And they kind of go it over and over and over again. I'm like, man, I don't want any of that. And uh, Lord showed me that he has keys that will unlock, literally unlock prison doors and break chains. And it doesn't have to be this thing where people have to keep telling their their the story of all their trauma over and over again, right. that they can be completely free of it, not only free of having to talk about it all the time, but even free from the memory of it and certainly free from the pain of it. And I'm like, okay, God, I should have figured this out by now that you're big enough to do this. But he showed me time and time and time again, right. uh, just what amazing, the, the, the news about Isaiah 61, where it says, that Jesus came to bring the good news to the afflicted, to the brokenhearted, to the poor, to the victimized, to the traumatized. And he said, I've come to bring the good news to these folks and I've come to heal their broken hearts. Right, mm -hmm. and right there is, is what the whole crux of the message is. And it's such a practical use of the gifts of the spirit because you can get a prophetic word while you're praying for somebody. You can get a word of knowledge. You can get a vision of something that happened to them in their childhood. And the Holy Spirit is just dropping these clues for you and i don't know a lot of people recognize that i mean to cut you off on sorry so why don't you give a little explanation of what trauma is and how would someone uh you know explain uh, how someone could have gotten trauma so when i began either pre you know giving a a message on trauma or when i teach 
I teach a seminar uh, and I've done it all over the United States in five different countries where I train people how to pray for folks who carry trauma. And the first thing I'll start out by saying is everybody has trauma. And I have the audience tell each other, everybody has trauma. And right there, you break the, the number one lie that most people who have been affected by trauma carry. And that is nobody knows the kind of trauma that I have dealt with. They, it isolates them. Uh, what trauma is, is basically something that either happened to you that you witnessed, or even in the case of children who did not get what they were supposed to get from their parents. Mm. And so that can be traumatic as well. So many times we just think of trauma as either something that soldiers go through or, mm. or police officers go through. But the reality is if you've ever been abused as a child, if you've ever been neglected or abandoned as a child, um, th that's, that's trauma as well. I, I like to, I talk about two types of trauma. I talk about trauma A, which is the absence of good things. So if you were brought up with parents that didn't give you the, the, the soul nutrients, the sense of identity, the sense of purpose, the sense of belonging, the sense that you're significant, that you're loved, that actually creates trauma in, in a little soul and causes you to not be as strong as, as others are uh, simply because you didn't get all that you were supposed to get as a child. Trauma B is the presence of bad things. And that is, those are bad things that happen to you, bad things that you witness, bad things that you see. So, you know, PTSD in particular, post-traumatic stress disorder, really kind of came into the American mainstream uh, through what happened at 9-11 uh, in New York City. And not only the trauma that everybody witnessed by watching that, but particularly how the first responders were affected for months and years afterwards. Right. And, and then when, of course, all of our soldiers were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, they were experiencing such levels of post-traumatic stress that that's, it began to be a lot of uh, uh, talk about that. But the reality is, is that trauma has been with us since Adam and Eve. Sure. Uh, you know, we didn't even get out of the first couple chapters of Genesis without uh, the trauma of, of being kicked out of the garden and, you know, uh, Cain and Abel uh, being in conflict and murder happening and all that stuff. So tra trauma, what I like to say is trauma is the opposite of God's dream for our lives mm -hmm. when he first created us. Mm -hmm. when, when he first had a, the thought that Mike Hutchings or Peter or, or Patricia would be a person, a son or daughter on this earth, that was the dream of God for our, for our lives. And that dream was something he wanted to see fulfilled in the way that we lived. But at the same point, we woke up in a war zone. And that war zone is the kingdom of darkness that had stolen so much of what God's dream was for this earth. And so many of us received lots of trauma from the very beginning of our lives here on earth mm -hmm. because the enemy was out to steal as, as Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief was out to steal, kill, and destroy the dream of God for our lives. Mm -hmm. And this is why that John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life mm -hmm. and have it more abundantly. When Jesus talks about that life, he's talking about the dream of God that he's always had for us. So mm -hmm. trauma is all of those things that have made your life miserable. All of those things that have hurt you and shed, literally the, the term brokenhearted in the Hebrew means a shattered heart or a shattered soul, that your, your soul is literally shattered by the things that you've experienced. And it brings you to a place where, uh, a, a place of real brokenheartedness and feeling lost and, and kind of alone. So uh, that's, to me, that's what, what trauma is. It's, it's that sense of your soul is shattered by either what you've experienced or what you didn't get when, when you were a child. Right. But in either case, you've been malnourished. Like you said, you didn't receive what you should have received. You weren't celebrated. You, you yeah. might have been barely tolerated or if there was alcohol use or abuse in the home, there was such an unstable atmosphere that you didn't get a real grounding. But then the love of God comes in and, and when it's demonstrated properly by Christians, uh, they, 
people don't even know how to handle unconditional love. It's like, why would you accept me? Or if you knew the real me, and and then we can just say, well, you know, if you knew the real me before I met Christ, you wouldn't like that person either. But he can change all of that as long as you're willing to surrender to his lordship. And and part of the issue, Peter, quite frankly, is that the Church of Jesus Christ has not really represented how good this Father is. Uh, as a matter of fact, preachers and lots of folks have developed a theology that God is the author of everybody's trauma, that he, <laughs> he puts things on you to teach you a lesson or to punish you or to, you know, and, and we end up with a schizophrenic God, which on one side, he loves us. He sent his son to die for us so we go to heaven. On the other side, he does things like puts cancer on you or puts you in a car accident to teach you a lesson. And, and uh, I'll be honest with you, when I talk with people about this, that's one of the biggest hurdles right. to yeah. get up is people's misunderstanding and, and an ungodly stronghold about the nature and character of God. Right. They connect oh, with church. And yeah. Church is not God. Sorry, hon. I totally had a misunderstanding of that. I grew up in a denominational church, and, and I did blame God for my father's death. And I, I actually told God I hated him and told people I was an atheist because I felt that if God was a loving God, why would these awful things happen? You know, I didn't have any understanding of, of God's nature. I wasn't born again at that point, but I had a real issue with that. And so when the father, when I start, you know, we had Jack Frost at our church so many times. And when um, I started to really learn about the father's love, I had issues with it. I was okay with Jesus, but I had a little hard time with the father. And uh, so the Lord had to bring a lot of healing into my heart. Yeah. And that's true. Honestly, Trish, that's so true for so many people. You know, honestly, it's easier sometimes to pray for somebody who hasn't been in church who carries trauma because I get to lead them to Jesus Christ and help them to experience uh, God's love in that way. And then I can break the trauma off of them because so many times uh, people have that exactly the mindset that you had that they, bl they blame God for all the bad things that, that have happened to them. One of the things I love about Randy and his one of his mentors was John Wimber. Uh, they both came out of very denominational structures that weren't teaching about the Holy Spirit. And instead of being critical of them, they went in and they, they blessed those people and prayed for them. And a lot of those churches got lit up and the Holy Spirit was then w welcomed. So, you know, like I don't, and I know you don't either, we're not trying to call anybody out because if we're living it, then we should be able to demonstrate it to people because they are still part of the body of Christ. It's just that this peace hasn't been made real to them yet. And if we have the answers, you know, I, I just love that. I, I remember John Wimber saying he was upset with God about a church that wasn't, you know, going along with this and they were criticizing him. And, and he said, God, do you love them too? And God said, yes, I love them too. And he said, even the smells and the bells <laughs> and and God said, yes, I love the smells and the bells. And God said, what don't, John said, what don't you like? And he said, your attitude. Because <laughs> it's the body of Christ, right? And, you know, if you've got revelation, you're not better than them. You should try to give it to them. And he did that all over the world. And Randy has as well. I just love that about Randy. Yeah, me too. Me too. So in, when we're, we're talking about trauma, as I said, uh, what, how trauma affects the human being, uh, because we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. You know, in your soul, I say that there's four components to your soul. A lot of people just say three, but you know, there's your mind, the way you you think. There's your emotions, the way you feel. There's your will, the way you choose. And then I say number four. There's your identity, how you think about yourself, who you really are. And trauma impacts all four of those areas. Uh, it, in I, and I'm going to go backwards. In identity, it makes you begin to think that the truest thing about yourself is your trauma mm -hmm. because that becomes the main story of your life mm -hmm. uh, because those memories and those experiences are always there. And there's so many folks that uh, carry around a spirit of trauma that is like a magnet to more 
traumatic experiences. It's actually a demonic spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, if you carry around the at the identity that you know all your life is about is trauma, then it affects the way you choose. You so you make bad decisions all the time about people. You make bad decisions about your life. You make bad decisions about what you allow into your life. Uh, in the midst of that, your emotions are all messed up and you live more by your feelings, which mostly are negative all the time, because once again, you've been traumatized. And obviously the last thing, the mind, it affects what you think because you begin to develop an ungodly stronghold uh, about your life, about an understanding of what's possible for you, about your identity. And it, it develops into such a, a shattered soul. Uh, that's literally what, what David talks about in Psalm 34, 18, he says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. But then later on in Psalm 147, three, it says the Lord heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus comes into your life, uh, yes, he heals your broken heart from the sin that you've carried, but he also goes a step farther and he wants to bring complete healing and restoration to the shattered soul, your your thoughts, your emotions, the way you make choices, and really your whole identity, mm. and uh, that that's all part of the kind of the prayer that that I train people in is that you have to bring people to the place where they can really begin to believe what God says about them, because trauma is really all about identity. I'm sure forgiveness comes into that process pretty early because part of why you can't let go of the pain is because. You might have felt betrayed or you feel let down that the person you were counting on didn't do what they were supposed to do uh, or they just kept speaking curses over you indirectly you know, like hurt people hurt people so sure. if your uh, if your father or your mother was abused you know it's likely that they don't know any better and if they weren't Christians and a lot of us you know were raised by parents that were Christian in name but weren't really practicing it uh, you know, they didn't have any tools. So like Danny Silk calls it a toolbox deficiency. Yeah. You just don't know what you're missing, but you know you're missing something. And then you just keep that negative feedback loop because you do what's familiar, but it's not redemptive. So well, I, I talk about how many of us were born into families with lots of pain. And unfortunately, when we're born into those, we, you know, I, don't, I can't explain why. It's just because once again, we wait, we are in a broken world. We're in a, a world full of sin that is for most part has rejected God. And because our families carry pain, they can't help but transfer their pain to us. And right. sometimes it's through literally physical abuse or sexual abuse. Sometimes it's just through the words and the curses that are spoken over us or the sense that our, our parents are so involved in their stuff that we are neglected and, and, and forsaken. Um, and that's, that's just the reality of so many people's lives. And unfortunately, when you are in that kind of a family, that's where all of uh, your identity, the sense of belonging, the sense of everything is developed. The sense of being able to trust people is developed right there. And if it's, if it's a traumatic environment, none of that gets developed in a healthy way, which is why we so desperately need Jesus to right. come in and heal our shattered soul. Right. And forgive that's the ones. Love, that's why I love the scripture. Jesus came to set the captives free. Yeah. And you know, for those who may be listening and you're in a lot of pain and there is hope, I just want to encourage you that Jesus came to set us free and he has a plan and he has a purpose and a destiny for you. And um, so, Mike, why don't you give us some steps in, in how you lead a person through uh, healing uh, oh, yeah. trauma? The, the one thing, because of John Wimber uh, being one of my mentors as well, one of the things I, I learned early on is that I was, as I was given an opportunity to pray for people, um, and, and I saw amazing results from kind of a step-by-step -step prayer model that the Holy Spirit gave me, I knew... I. I I didn't want to be known as the trauma guy. I mean, I did. I, I didn't see myself standing and praying for hundreds and hundreds of people. We had to train people. So over the past um, six years, I've been training people, um, prayer ministers, counselors, chaplains, therapists, uh, just regular everyday people who have a heart uh, for trauma in this prayer model that really 
what, what this does, it doesn't deal with everything that's wrong in the human heart or mind, but it breaks through. It's a breakthrough prayer that breaks through the wall of trauma that people kind of have if they've had a lot of trauma in their lives so that they can get a sense of feeling normal again. So then they can go on and receive prayer and ministry and counseling for all the other issues that they might have. So the, I, I look to Isaiah 61, which Trish, you, you quoted, as just kind of like a, a model for the prayer. And basically what Jesus said is that he, that he said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 uh, of himself, that he had come to declare good news to the afflicted and the poor. Right. So the first thing part of the, of the prayer is to help the person receive the forgiveness of God. Even if they're a believer in Christ, I just plead the blood of Jesus over them. And I say, have you fully received all that Jesus paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ? That no matter what you've done, that the forgiveness is already there. All you have to do is receive it. And then as they, re as they receive that forgiveness, then I say, now, are there people that have hurt you and wounded you or, or, or you know, really forsaken you that you need to forgive? And I, I say this to them, and this is strictly from the Holy Spirit. I say, look, even if you don't have the will to forgive, are you willing to receive the grace of God that is the empowering presence mm -hmm. to, to forgive and release this person? Because as long as you're attached to the people to hurt you, you're still attached to them. Right. When you don't forgive them, you, there's, you're in bondage to them. But the Holy Spirit wants you to be free of all of that. And will you, will you forgive them? And, and I've never had anybody turn me down yet. And I'm telling you, I've seen some of the most horrific cases of abuse, and things that um, I, I certainly don't want to get into. But yeah. after they've received even, forgiveness even if, and after... Go even, ahead, Peter. even if it was a relative that passed away... Sometimes they think, well, I, I can't get closure because they're gone, but you are still attached to them because you're holding that unforgiveness. So you can, you can forgive them in abstentia, and you Absol have to. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That, and I've seen that over and over again. I've got a testimony of a lady who was abused both by her father as well as by her husband, and uh, her husband committed suicide, and yet she was still tormented by all the demons that were both on her dad and her, her mom or on her husband and uh, couldn't sleep, which just had tremendous amount of torment. But when we severed the soul ties that were connecting them and she re completely released them, she got completely set free, slept all eight hours for the first time in over 30 years, mm -hmm. literally, and uh, got completely set free. So right. after forgiveness, I go after shame and guilt, you know, shame, says there's something wrong with me right it, it deals with your identity that there's something inherently bad about me which is why the things have happened to me and and then uh, you know i i look at the person in the eye and i said because of the blood of jesus christ i say to you if you've received his work on the cross then there's nothing to be ashamed of any longer shame is to have no part of you any longer and and to understand that you are a beloved child of god and after we deal with the shame, we go after the guilt. And, you know, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 is my favorite verse because it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. So Peter and Trish, so much of the, of the prayer model is just declaring the scripture and the promises of God over people. I make sure they look me in the eyes the whole time. The Holy Spirit gave me that key. Because if they close their eyes, they kind of, they, mm -hmm. they withdraw within themselves. They're not able to receive. But there's something both spiritually as well as I learned from neuroscience, neurologically, that happens when you're looking at somebody in the eye and you're praying for them and declaring over them and the love of God pours out through you. So uh, once we deal with shame and guilt, then we just go after the assignment of the enemy, which is those demons that are, are able to actually have access to people's uh, lives through the trauma wounds. You know, when you've experienced trauma and you're carrying wounds, they're actually open doors of access for the spirit of trauma, the spirit of fear, the spirit of torment, uh, the spirit of rage and anger, the spirit of suicide. Um, all of those are, are demonic spirits that while you may be a Christian, you're not possessed, 
by those spirits. They still have influence. They speak to you in the place of that wound, in the place of where that trauma is still shattering your heart. And so we, because they've received forgiveness, they no longer have any ground. So we just go after uh, every demonic thing that the Holy Spirit leads us to. We sever soul ties. If anybody's had any sexual violation or any sexual abuse or even illicit sexual relationships uh, that were outside of the realm of a covenant marriage. We sever that soul tie as well because demons traffic through, uh, through soul ties. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, once we, we take them through that, then uh, we go after just praying for their, their, their shattered soul. And we actually, I have the people that I pray for lift their souls to God and say, Father, here's my shattered soul. Here are the pieces. Please put them back together according to your original design for my soul. Because mm -hmm. see, God has a dream for what yeah. he wants your soul to look like. And trauma has shattered it. But as we lift up our souls to God, he, he does an amazing work of bringing healing to that. And then after that, I go after the mind. And um, I've learned so much in neuroscience, Peter and Tricia, from people like Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Uh, and from others, I have a, a, a friend who is a professor of neuroscience at Liberty University. I learned that in the right back quadrant of the brain, that's where all the traumatic memories uh, and images of trauma are stored. And they can actually affect the way that you're able to access your own short-term and long-term memories. And uh, they're, they're there, those memories are there, and they actually bring blockage to the normal flow of your brain. So we pray against those traumatic images and memories, just like Jesus prayed against the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 that was not producing good fruit. We just declare dry up and die in Jesus' name. We sever the neural pathway to those traumatic images and memories. We sever the five senses, the seeing, the smelling, the tasting, touching, and hearing. And uh, we just see people get so set free. They, they get their memories back. They, they meant so many folks who carry trauma have short-term memory loss. Mm -hmm. And they think it has to do with their age, when in reality, it has to do with the damage that the trauma has done up here. Mm -hmm. But when the spirit of God comes on them, they just, they get their, they get their memories back. They get their short-term memory back and they can actually remember the good things about their lives as opposed to the bad things. And then of course, as I said at the end of the last step is inviting the Holy Spirit to come and fill every area that trauma has occupied. And then I lead them through a declaration of who the New Testament says they are in Christ. You know, I start out with 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, if any person be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away, all things have become new. And I literally, I ask them to repeat after me because it's significant. If you can hear yourself declaring the promises of God, it's like David saying in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hearing themselves declare, this is who I am in Christ, does something to reset their thinking, their identity, their emotions, so that they can really begin to see God's true dream for their lives. So Beautiful. that's a very short version, quick version of, of the trauma prayer. It's so powerful. Can you, can you share a testimony of somebody that, that you ministered to that was um, literally had a physical healing as a result of, of being released from trauma? So two weeks ago, I was in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And I had been there two, two weeks ago. I was there. I'd been there two years ago and had done a, uh, a, a seminar. And one of the associate pastors there, a lady by the name of Kay, uh, received tremendous amount of healing from trauma during the seminar. But what I did not know is that she had carried fibromyalgia, that is significant chronic nerve pain throughout her whole body where she had trigger points and things like this. And uh, that Sunday morning, two years ago, when she got up to give her testimony, she started talking about how once she got released of her trauma, she also got released of all of her fibromyalgia. So she was standing in front of the church and she was saying, watch this, look. And she started <laughs> literally hitting herself at all the trigger points. So I'm there two weeks ago and I, I, I had seen the testimony, but I didn't have a recording of it. 
So she was there and I said, it's okay. Does it still apply? She goes, absolutely. So she starts hitting herself again. So I got a video testimony, mm -hmm. but for the last two years, she's been completely free right. of fibromyalgia. I had, I'll give you two more real quick testimonies. I had a, um, a Vietnam veteran who came to our very first Unbroken conference uh, that we do in March at the ARC there in Mechanicsburg. And he had um, had his leg, his right leg blown off uh, when he stepped on a mine in Vietnam. And he had carried what, the, what is known as phantom nerve pain, mm -hmm. where people lose their, their limbs, they can still feel the, the pain. He had been on medications for that phantom nerve pain since Vietnam. The Lord healed him of his trauma and all of his nerve pain left, was gone. He was able to literally get off all of his medications and, and be completely free. That's awesome. Um, the, last, the last one is just really quick. I was in San Diego and I didn't even get to pray for this, this little girl. Uh, she was 16 years of age. Uh, she was brilliant. She was a uh, uh, valedictorian in her honors Christian high school. But she also did some martial arts and she slipped and fell one day in doing some practice and caught the back of her head in, on a piece of exercise equipment. She had a, I mean, a severe traumatic brain injury where she lost all of her memory. She had difficulty process. I mean, she could remember who she was, but every, everything else in terms of you know, just how to do things, she lost it. Uh, she had audio and visual difficulty uh, her in order to to do her work her mom had to read to her everything uh, because she could not visually process it and after the swelling went down and everything she was basically she they just gave her no hope she says you know you're going to be able to function but you're not going to be able to function it the way that you were and I literally prayed a very short prayer over a group of people that she was part of and uh, when she said that as the prayer was happening, she felt this amazing both electricity as well as like honey pour all over her head. Mm -hmm. And she felt this clarity of mind like she hadn't felt in years. So when we get, I left and it was, a, like I said, it was a very short, it was only a one hour meeting. I left and she says, mom, show me, you know, show me a book. And so he, she handed her the seminar book. Uh, it was Kingdom Foundations. And she started literally reading for her mom, the wow. entire Kingdom Foundations book. Now, here's the best part. That night when she went home, when she went to sleep, as she was going to sleep, she saw in her mind's eye every page that she looked at in that Kingdom Foundations so that she ended up with a mnemonic memory. Wow. So literally, she could everything she looked at, she could remember. So the the cool thing about this is her high school let her go back and redo all of her work that she had done not a really good job in because of her injury. She ended up graduating as a valedictorian of her high school, and she went into an honors program at Azusa Pacific University. Hallelujah. So that, that is such a yay God kind of a thing. It's oh, just yeah. amazing. Well, I would love for you to pray over my brain so I can remember things from uh, yesterday. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I'll be glad to. <laughs> I would like to just kind of high level talk about what's way more common today. I mean, you said you celebrated your 39th wedding anniversary recently. Yep. Trish and I just had 35 not too long ago. And life is very different today than it was when we got married. You know, like the general cultural things that are accepted, uh, you know, the, the standards have been loosened to the point of the almost no standards anymore. And with that has been a decrease in the nuclear family, an increase in molestation and, and sexual abuse of people. Um, and in our experience, that's one of the hardest trauma points that people go through is when it has to do with their sex being molested really impacts their identity they they take some blame rightfully or wrongfully they you know they're just so confused about what happened to them and it's so unfair because you know the vast majority of the time they were not you know they were not consenting to anything 
or they were drugged or, you know, something happened that caused them to be taken advantage of, and it's just such a deep pain. Um, so, again, that's a big topic. I don't expect to go into a lot of detail, but if you could just give some hope to people um, about how the Lord heals that, and, you know, again, back in the Old Testament it said, God makes the crooked way straight, right? And, and that's one of those tangles that happens in a person's life that, you know, we have just seen the Lord do amazing miracles to, to recalibrate that identity and get, you know, like we call it like restoring the innocence. In fact, Tricia uh, Frost, I think, uses that expression as well. Like even though you felt violated, the Lord can restore your innocence. When you've been sexually violated or through as, as actually the lady that I talked to you about, Kay, talked about that one of her primary uh, traumatic things was the fact that she had a lot of sexual misconduct as a young lady and she was looking, she was looking for acceptance. She was looking to belong and she was looking for people to like her. And uh, whenever either, if you've been sexually violated or you've you made some really bad choices in the realm of sex, it does traumatize your soul to such an extent that once again, remember trauma is about identity. So the first thing you think is I'm, a, I'm ruined. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no good anymore. I'm, I'm less valuable because of the things that have either happened to me or the choices that I've made. And so shame and guilt come as this, these twins that just continually to devastate a person. And, you know, the great thing about Isaiah 61 is that Jesus says, he says, here's what he's called to do. I've come to bring good news. He says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. And then this is what he says. I've come to declare liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Mm -hmm. Those are two types of people. You're captive by what has happened to you. So if you were sexually violated, if you were raped, if you were molested, you never asked for that. It, 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 it came to you. Mm -hmm. And so you're held in chains and shackles like a slave almost to those things that happened to you. And you begin to make choices based upon what happened to you. You know, the, the, the number of people, quite frankly, Peter and Trish, that I've prayed for that have a difficulty with the spirit of lust and perversion, even though they were sexually violated, you have to understand that spirit of lust and perversion was from the person who did that to you. And now its influence is influencing you. And you even make decisions based upon that that only further traumatizes you. Jesus says, I've come, as you said, Tricia, I've come to break the chains and set the captives free. Whatever has happened to you no longer defines you. That's basically what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. and then to the other group who make all these bad decisions, how do you get into prison? You, you get into prison because you make a bad decision. You violate the law and you get sentenced and you get put into a prison cell. And for, forevermore, you're considered to be defined by the choice that you made. And Jesus says, I've come to set you free from that as well. My blood is sufficient to not only break the power of shame, but also to break the power of guilt and condemnation and to set you free. So you're, the, Jack Hayford has a, has a whole series of messages on why sex sins are sometimes the worst sins or the, the sexual violation is the worst thing that can happen to the human soul because what it does to us, what it does to our identity, what it does to our sense of worth. And the good news, no matter how you've been violated, no matter what bad choices that you've made that have resulted in sexual trauma, I want to declare to you in Jesus' name that that is not part of who you are. That's not how you're defined. It's not part of your identity. I want to say to you tonight in Jesus' name that you can not only be free of that, but you can walk and actually, as Peter just referred to, actually feel a restoration of innocence a restoration of the sense that that no longer defines me any longer. You have to understand something. I haven't said this to you guys, but my prayer model has been used in Iraq in safe houses for women and children who were sold into sex slavery by ISIS. So we have all these women and children that were, they, they were pure in, in what they were, and then they were captured by ISIS and, and abused in horrible, horrible ways and the lord used a ministry crisis response international to take that uh, to take that prayer model and train counselors to help those women and children so that they no longer have to let 
the horrible things that happened to them define and shape the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. There is true freedom in Jesus' name from anything that has happened to you. Amen. In case um, people might not be aware, uh, Joyce Meyer has a, about an hour-long testimony of her own life. And, you know, she had been horribly abused herself. And she talks about how, she, you know, the Lord gave her the ability to forgive the person who did it. And I highly recommend it. It's called One Life by Joyce Meyer. And she's very honest. And it's not the easiest thing to watch, but it's so powerful that if anybody that's watching is dealing with that, I, I, I just encourage you, you know, to ask the Lord to help you through her testimony because, you know, once, once you've lived through it and been healed, you have a certain conviction about the power of God to, you know, she's not reading it out of a book. She knows that God freed her from the bondage that she was in because of that trauma that happened to her. And let me say this, because once again, remember I said how I have everybody say everybody has trauma when I start my messages. Yes. I want to say this to every person that's been sexually violated or molested in any way. In our country today, the statistics are one in three women will have had some kind of unwanted sexual encounter or experience by the time that they are 13. Mm -hmm. One in five men will have had some kind of, uh, of unwanted sexual encounter or molestation by the time that they are 13. So I want you to know that it is, it is at a pandemic level. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm as, as hurtful as it is to hear it, I'm thankful that the, the uh, veil of deception and secrecy has been taken off how the church has been complicit in a lot of sexual abuse. And, you know, it says judgments begins first in the house of God. Right. And, you know, we need to, we, we need to be as churches that are seeking to heal people's hearts. We need to have our arms open for all of those who have even been sexually molested and violated by the church. Yeah. It's really yeah. important not to judge hurting people because you just have no idea what might have happened to them that they're not going to ever tell you. And you don't know how you would have responded to what happened to them. So it's just best to let them trust that you're a safe person to talk to and that you're not going to judge them for something that might have happened. And then that could be the first step to helping them have a conversation to, to feel vulnerable, to be able to talk about things that they might be ashamed to have to, to, to uh, you know, uncover. The devil loves the dark. So, Mike, what, what, excuse me, um, what about, well, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I was going to go, I was going to change lanes here. Go for it. Okay. So what about abortion? Um, we all, we, you know, we know that there's such, you know, there's sex, sex, sexual sin and pornography and that's, that's, that's rampant in the world, right? And then now with abortion, we know that many don't understand the ramifications of it and what happens. Because, you know, we know the scriptures that, that Jesus says, before I knew you, I knew you before you were, in, you, you were in your mother's womb. And, you know, for those who are, who are listening, there may be some contemplating an abortion, but there are some that had an abortion that are suffering guilt over that. And I know you address guilt and shame but um, what about that? Do you, would you consider that to be a form of trauma? So when I started this ministry, uh, when, when the Holy Spirit did, I didn't start it. I just made myself available. Um, I did not understand the extent of trauma that so many people suffer in so many different ways. And, you know, if I had, I've never been pro-choice, but if I had been a pro-choice person, that is, Women have a right to, to do with their bodies whatever they want, including aborting a child. If I had been a pro-choice person before I started doing this, I would be a pro-life person now, if for no other reason that the devastating damage and trauma that I see in women who have what it's called post-abortion syndrome. Mm -hmm. what is, it's basically a post-traumatic stress disorder that comes on them from the moment that the procedure is completed and they carry it for the remainder of their days uh, uh, without without healing from Jesus. And although they may appear to be functioning, the reality is they're so broken on the inside 
because it's like, yes, they, they see abortion as a solution to a problem, but the reality is that the problem is so much worse afterwards because of how it literally shatters their soul and they carry such guilt and such shame that of course they're not, they can't really talk about it. I have a cousin who runs a very large um, women's pregnancy center. Uh, it's a, actually a service in southern, central and southern Indiana. And he said of all the services that they give, the number one thing that they're addressing right now is women who carry post-abortion syndrome. Mm -hmm. That it's, it causes so many women to want to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. they, they do self-harming behaviors. They get into addictions because they are trying to deal with the pain of the choice that they made. Mm -hmm. So uh, abortion is definitely, uh, you know, abortion and even, and miscarriage as well. Miscarriage is a trauma as well. I, mm -hmm. I pray for a number of ladies who have dealt with miscarriage. So all of that is part of the, the big thing of, of having a life within you that is suddenly terminated. That's a real trauma. Right. Wow. And part of you the know, the, yeah, the enemy knows that, um, you know, he's so slick in his um, maneuvers towards the body of Christ. And the Bible says that not to be ignorant of Satan's devices and, and how he tries to lure people into making these decisions. And then the people suffer so much as a result of that. And that's why we're pro, you know, life. It, it, it's, first of all, it's a human being, but it's also, we know the ramifications and what happens in the torment and the pain. And, but Jesus, again, came to set the captives free. So if you're listening and you had an abortion, this isn't to put guilt on you. This is to bring healing and to let you know that you can be healed. And that Jesus's blood is powerful enough to set you free. And also, and, you know, uh, again, it, it, if there are people that I know, there's Christians I spoke to that were contemplating abortion at one time or another. And, and, and then when they heard the good news, they, they didn't. When they understood that this is a human life, you know, it's not a blob. It's a human being that you are carrying and that it's that serious. And um, so now I'm glad you, you, you know, um, you know, spoke a little bit about that because it's really a serious issue. Yeah, well, I did. And, and I, I, we have, uh, I've trained people who are in women's shelters, who are in pregnancy, women's pregnancy services, uh, like my cousin runs in, in central Indiana. And uh, I, I can tell you literally of hearing of hundreds of testimonies of women who've gotten set free from mm -hmm. um, the, the heat, from the abortion that, that they had performed and really walking away from that in freedom. Yeah. I think one of the biggest lies is we're two consenting adults and you know, no, there's no harm being done here because they see it completely as a physical thing. They don't understand the spiritual dynamic that you have a soul and that your soul gets scrambled when you, when you interfere with that process of creating life and boy, they realize it after when their heart is in pieces that it was more than just two consenting adults and no harm is done. But at that point, the harm has been done. So if they don't find the answer in Christ, what do they do? They medicate their pain. They, you know, they just try to block it out. I mean, the guy, Adrian, that you know, we referred to on the video, the testimony, uh, he said there was 15 to 20 medications on six pages each is how many medications he was being given and he completely went off them all after five minutes of prayer. <laughs> well, supernatural. And, and this is a, what I'm going to say next is pretty controversial, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Um, I believe that one of the main reasons for the opioid epidemic that we have in our nation is because the Veterans Administration, the doctors and the counselors there in many cases through uh, narcotics and opioids at, at returning soldiers um, who were in a lot of soul pain and sometimes physical pain. Right. It just really, I mean, I can't, I can tell you that just about every veteran that I have prayed for has had some kind of opioid thrown at them mm -hmm. over the last 20 years mm -hmm. by the Veterans Administration. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's really, 
it's just something that the Holy Spirit told me to pray against. I mean, I don't have any facts about it, but the reality is the more and more that our soldiers turned from battle and the government wasn't doing anything about the trauma, you know, the, the thing that uh, up until just the last couple of years, the message that returning soldiers received was, uh, if you have PTSD, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Right. So what we're going to do is going to give you medication, we're going to give you you know, counseling, but basically you're just going to have to cope with it for the rest of your days, right. which brings hopelessness and despair, which is why even today we have over 20 veterans or active duty soldiers committing suicide every day. Right. There are, we've lost more veterans and soldiers to suicide than we did in both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's such a tragedy. Yeah. Police officers, firemen, yeah that have to go in and find bodies that have been burned, like just tragic things that they can't get out of their minds that the Lord can heal, but they're just not, they're, they're not aware of that option. So again, back to the church, if we do our job, uh, there'll be a ripple effect, a positive feedback loop as opposed to the negative. So um, we've, we've used up an hour of your time, so send us your bill. <laughs> no. I know no. that it's been very redemptive. <laughs> You know, the, the, the one thing, you know, I don't promote myself. I don't try to get on stages or anything like that. I let the Holy Spirit speak to people uh, about what I do and just allow it go more. You know, thank God for the platform that Randy gave me, uh, which is amazing, which is how a lot of this message has gotten out there. But it's such a privilege to find another audience, Amen. to be able to share the hope and the good news yeah. that Amen. there is healing from trauma. Amen. That you don't have to be defined by all the bad things that either you've done or what's what's happened to you. I, I, I when I'm praying for people, I, I say this. Say this with me. As a matter of fact, let's do it together. Yeah. According to God. According I, to God. I am no longer. I am no longer. Defined by my history. Defined, defined by my history. What I have done. What I have done. Or what has been done to me. Or what has been done to me. I am defined. I am defined by who my papa calls me. By who my papa calls me. He calls me his beloved child. He calls me his beloved child. In whom he is well pleased. In whom he is well pleased. Amen. And you know, I have I literally have people after they receive trauma prayer. I say, take that phrase and go home and every morning get in the mirror, look at yourself. And say that to yourself over and over and over again Amen. until you fully believe it. Amen. Amen. So That's could so you do me one favor? I'll, yeah. I'll be uh, Adrian, and you just look in my eyes and just pray. I don't, not for me. I just want to stand in for anybody in the audience who yeah. might be feeling that shame, that they would just have the courage to look you in the eye. Just speak a Father's blessing, because yeah, so few people have ever had that. I'm going to speak a father's blessing over you. And then I'm going to pray for Trisha's mind because she asked me to do that. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So just put your hand right here. You know, this is not where your soul is, but for us, it's kind of the heart of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so keep your eyes open. Everybody that's on this, on this right now, keep your eyes open and look in the camera. Father in Jesus name, I thank you for every one of your amazing sons and daughters for whom you created with an amazing dream. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood right now. I plead the blood of Jesus. I thank you that Jesus suffered trauma on our behalf so that we could be healed of ours. So right now, according to Isaiah 53, 5, that says, by the wounds of his trauma, we are healed. I speak healing to every broken heart, every shattered soul that's here. I speak healing to the mind to the will, to the emotions, and to your identity in Jesus' name. I sever every assignment of the spirit of trauma, the spirit of fear, the spirit of suicide, the spirit of rage and murder, the spirit of hopelessness, despair and depression, and even the spirit of death. I sever that assignment against you right now in Jesus' name. And I just declare to your soul, be healed and restored, even as it says in Psalm 23, that as the Lord is my shepherd, that he always leads me to wonderful places where he restores my soul. So according to the promise of that psalm, I say, let your soul be restored and healed in Jesus' name. Now take your right hand and put it right up here on the right back quadrant of your, of your head. 
This is where all the traumatic images and memories are stored. Now keep looking at me because this is a very important moment. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that it is by your spirit that our minds are renewed. And when our minds are renewed, we are transformed by your spirit. So in the name of Jesus, I speak to every traumatic image and memory that resides right up here in the right quadrant of the brain. I, by the sword of the spirit, I sever the neural pathway that leads to those memories. And I sever your five senses, your seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing from being triggers to those memories. And in Jesus' name, I speak healing to your mind. I say in the name of Jesus, memory center, wake up, wake up, wake up. Let there come a free flow of memory from your hippocampus, which is where all your memory files are stored through the right lobe of your brain to your frontal cortex, where you will be able to recall all the good things about your life. And I also declare healing of the short-term memory. That the short-term memory be restored. You'll be able to remember where you put your keys, your phone, and your car in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and fill every area of every life where trauma has occupied. And we declare that the plans of the enemy are canceled and let the dream of God for each life come true. Let it be realized and let it be launched in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to see you guys. And you. Thanks. And I uh, just feel led to say to anybody watching, if they were hurt in church, that, uh, you know, we understand that that happens, and we're really sorry as ministers that that does happen. But please uh, accept a, uh, a general apology on behalf of ministry because it's a difficult job and and God has built the church with flawed people for thousand, 2,000 years. Uh, I, I, I have to believe they don't do it intentionally. They might do it out of ignorance, but it still hurts. But but don't don't throw Jesus out because you had a bad oh. experience. Give me one minute to say this. I've had the opportunity to pray for so many people, both in the pew, in the seats, as well as in the pulpit, who suffer what I call post-traumatic church syndrome, yeah. where they were traumatized by the church. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were rejected. They were they were hurt, they were wounded, and they lost their faith in God or they've not been able to ever go back to church again. And I, I wanna say, if that's you, I, I agree with Peter, I'm sorry. As a, as a leader of the church, I'm so sorry. We did not represent Jesus or the heart of the Father well, but we want you to know that however you've been abused, that is not the heart of the Father, that's not the heart of Jesus. I wanna tell you, there's great places like King of Kings Worship Center that do represent. They will love you and they will care for you and they will minister to you so that you can be healed and step in to the fullness of the dream of God for your life. Amen. Thanks, Mike. So Appreciate good, Mike. It. We have to have you come in person. Yeah, I would like, love to come. You're not too so far. Invite, we'll put it together. We'll make you it will. happen. Okay. Love, love you guys. Have a great have night. All right, you too. Bye-bye now.